Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to thank each of you for joining with me for Wednesday's Daily Bible Study coming from Charlene's Outreach Ministries. We have a great and powerful lesson, Made Alive with Christ. Made Alive with Christ, coming from Colossians 2, verses 10 through 15. And man, it's a great and wonderful lesson, but before we get started, we're going to ask if anything is said, touches your heart, soul, or spirit. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to jot them at the bottom of the screen below, and I will get to them as soon as possible. Also, if you would, subscribe to my channel and join with us as we together, as a body of Christ, study and meditate on the word of the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> also, we're going to get ready and move into our lesson, but first we're going to have prayer, then we'll move right into our lesson. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into no temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory are thine. Dear God in heaven, I thank you, Father. I thank you for making a way out of no way. I thank you for leading me and guiding me in your true path of right. Thank you for showing us the way to go in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done, you is doing, and you shall do in each of our lives. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Father, at this time, we thank you that we pronounce healing, blessing, and protection, and guidance over all those at the sound of my voice and whenever this is heard. As we as it is said in your word, Father, by your stripes we are healed. And it was completed over 2,000 years ago, Father. And we thank you for that healing. We thank you for that deliverance. We thank you for that uh, guidance and protection in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you honor, glory, and praise, and we thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that as we go into your lesson, Father, that you will open our eyes that we see and our ears that we hear, and you give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from on high as we study and meditate on the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, <clears throat> made alive with Christ, coming from Colossians 2, verses 10 through 15. We're going to split this up a little bit. Uh, Begin with verse 10, the 12 states, reads, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with this circumcision made without hands, and put it off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. Amen. The, the, the speaking of the apostle is still trying to impress on the readers, the, uh, on us, the all sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ, reminding us of his sufficiency and of the perfect standing which they, we, they have in him. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and the believer is complete in him. Spurgeon gives good definition of the completeness. He says we are, number one, complete without the aid of Jewish ceremony. Number two, complete without the help of philosophy. Number three, we're complete without the invitation or stupid superstitions. And number four, we're complete without human merit. This one in whom we are complete is the head of all principality and power. The Gnostic word greatly taken up with the subject of angels. Mention of this is made later on in this chapter, but Christ is head over all the angelic beings. And it would be ridiculous to be occupied with uh, angels when we can have the creator of angels as the object of our affections and enjoy the communion with him. Amen. Circumcision <clears throat> has the typical right of Judaism. It is a minor surgical operation in which the knife was applied to the flesh of the male child. Spiritually, it signified death 
to the flesh are a putting on aside of the evil, corrupt, unregenerate nature of man. Unfortunately, the Jewish people became occupied with the literal ceremony, but neglected its spiritual meaning in trying to achieve favor with God through ceremonies and good works. They were said in effect that there was something in human flesh which could please God. Nothing could be farther from the truth. In the ver in the verse before <clears throat> us Physical circumcision is not in view, but rather that the spiritual circumcision, which is true of everyone who has put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. This is clear from the expression, the circumcision made without hand, which is made to the heart uh, where we are changed. What the verse is teaching is this. Every believer is circumcised by the circumcision of Christ. The circumcision of Christ refers to his death on the cross of Calvary. And, and, and the thought is that when the Lord Jesus died, the believer died also. He died to sin, Romans 6 and 11, to the law, to self, uh, Galatians uh, 2 and 20, and to the world, Galatians 6 and 14. This circumcision was made without hands in the sense that the human hands can have no part in, <clears throat> in it by way of merit. Man cannot deserve or, ear, or earn it. It is God's work. Thus, he has put off the body of the sins of the flesh. In other words, when a person is saved, he becomes associated with Christ in his death and renounces any hope of earning a deserving salvation through fleshly efforts. Samuel Rideout writes, Our Lord's death has not only put away the fruit, but condemn the and set aside the very root which bore it. Paul now turns from the subject of circumcision to that of baptism. Just as circumcision speaks of death to the flesh, even so baptism speaks of the burial of the old man. Thus we read, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. The teaching here is that we have not only died with Christ, but we have been buried with him. This was typified at our baptism. It took place at the time of our conversion, but we expressed it in public confession when we went into the waters of baptism. Baptism is burial, the burial of all that we were as children of Adam. In baptism, we acknowledge that nothing in ourselves could ever please God. And so we are put in the flesh out of God's sight forever, but it does not end with burial. Not only have we been crucified with Christ and buried with him, but we have also risen with him to walk in newness of life. All of this takes place at the time of conversion. It is through faith in the working of God who raised Christ from the dead. Verses 13 to 15 says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a sure of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The Apostle Paul now makes the application of all this to the Colossians. Before their conversion, they had been dead in their trespasses. This means that because of their sins, because of our sins, we were <clears throat> spiritually dead toward God. It does not mean that their spirits were dead, but simply that there was no motion in their spirit toward God, and there was nothing they could do to win God's favor. Amen. <clears throat> Not only were they dead in sin, but also 
Paul speaks of the uncircumcision of their flesh. Uncircumcision is often used in the New Testament to describe the Gentile people. The Colossians had been Gentiles as we once were. They had not been members of God's earthly people. The Jews, therefore, they had been in a position of distance from God as we were had and had given full reign to the flesh with its lust. But when they heard the gospel and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as we did, they had been made alive together with Christ and all their trespasses had been forgiven as ours have. Amen. In other words, what had really happened to the Colossians was that their whole lifestyle had been changed. Their history as sinners had come to an end. And now they were new crea creatures in Christ Jesus. They were living on the resurrection side. Therefore, they should say goodbye to all that uh, characterized them as men in the flesh. Now, Paul goes on to describe something else that was included in the work of Christ, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he was taken and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, the handwriting of requirements that was against us described the law. In a sense, the Ten Commandments were against us, condemning us because we did not keep them perfectly. But the Apostle Paul is thinking not only about the Ten Commandments, but also about the ceremonial law that was given to Israel. In the ceremonial law, there were all kinds of commandments with regard to holy days and foods and other religious rituals. These were all of a part of the prescribed religion of the Jews. They pointed toward to the coming of the Lord Jesus. They were shadows of his person and his work. And in his death on the cross, he took all of this out of the way, nailing it to the cross and counseling it as a bill is counseled when the debt is paid. As Meyer put it, by death, by the death of Christ on the cross, the law which condemned men lost its penal authority inasmuch as Christ, by his death, endured for man the curse of the law and became the end of the law. Kelly summarizes neatly, the law is not dead, but we have died to it. Paul's language here very likely refers to an ancient practice of nailing the written evidence of a council debt on a public place as a notice to all that the creditor had no more claim on the debtor. <clears throat> by, by his death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection and ascension, the Lord Jesus also conquered evil powers, making a public spectacle of them and triumphing over them. We believe that this is the same triumph that is described in Ephesians 4, where the Lord Jesus is said to have led captivity captive. His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension were a glorious triumph over all the hosts of hell and of Satan as he passed up through this, the atmosphere on his way back to heaven. He passed through the very dominion of the one who is the prince of the power of the air. Perhaps this verse carries special comfort for those who have been converted from, dom from dominionism but who might still be obsessed with the fear of evil spirits there's nothing to fear if we are in Christ because he has disarmed principalities and power. We are to live in Christ. Amen. We are to uh, allow the old man to die and the new man to live again. Amen. This is a great and wonderful and powerful lesson. I pray you meditate on this lesson and have a wonderful and blessed day. God bless you.